Now there are a few more things that we can talk about in this case. Um, one of them being the physical location or the physical space itself. Um, the school was located in downtown and this lent itself to field trips and businesses and the museum district. The building itself was small. Um, it lacked sufficient space for a gym and its heating wasn't always certain. In spite of, of this, uh, all these kinds of uh, deficits, uh, the individuals in the school did not want to move to another building even when they were offered it. Um, Metz argues that the context put everyone into shared spaces. It pushed them together and created more of a warm atmosphere. All the teachers reported that the school's small size and partitioning into units enabled the teachers to get to know students individually and to have a healthy rapport with one another. So in some ways this, this eventually leads to kind of a, a healthy faculty culture and ethos. So the faculty regarded uh, themselves to have good relations with students and with one another. Um, and they saw that kind of uh, positive relationship as an end in itself, uh, something to strive for, as well as kind of a means to better learning. With few exceptions, teachers viewed all students as essentially good children. They had this kind of benign view of, of youth, a uh, kind of belief, a uh, deep social structure feature. And they regarded the mutual rapport but with students and with one another as normal. Um, it was naturalized. Uh, teachers didn't misidentify with their students. They didn't see them as, as um, uh, disjoint or uh, rebel uh, resistant. Uh, the faculty culture uh, doesn't just happen though, and, and Metz argues that it has to be rebuilt, passed on, and renewed. And this occurred in several ways during uh, various kinds of meetings, like team meetings and faculty lounge conversations. Teachers in these kind of conversations tended to interject positive comments that spun uh, negative ones in, in positive ways. So new recruits got socialized through these experiences so the culture was passed on. So someone might show up from another school and criticize a student and the teacher spins it in a different direction that's positive. Um, informal leaders respectfully sanctioned new teachers that adopted a negative view of students and they redirected them to one of respect and building them up. Um, that said, uh, the culture wasn't necessarily uniform. There were exceptions and Metz's remarks on five teachers angrily confronting students uh, are a case in point. Uh, these teachers tended not to use group instruction but rather whole, whole class and recitation. In addition, the students knew who they were and responded to them negatively. Uh, that said, Metz is quick to point out that these teachers were, were negative relative to the teachers in the school. So that's not terribly bad uh, in comparison to say teachers in uh, um, the junior high uh, that used to be next door. Her point is that the school culture is a fragile construction that needed to be re reproduced through various kinds of uh, uh, interactions and activities and routines that are built into the social structure. Uh, a final thing to talk about is the principal. So here we have a leader uh, and they have great influence on the organization. Uh, the principal, Mrs. Michael, uh, influenced the tone of interpersonal relationships via all sorts of indirect and informal means. But she controlled the IGE curriculum and its instruction via more direct and formal and authoritative means. So we have very different kinds of approaches there. Um, it was an official doctrine to have positive relationships with students, but the principal encouraged it in a, a variety of ways. In her speeches, she valued building up students. Um, she wanted relative assessments to occur, to occur and, and she wanted these over and above objective or universal assessments. Um, she wanted teachers to do field trips and she encouraged ethnic pride and was involved in those groups and sought their integration. Um, she even publicly appreciated teachers who led extracurricula and made it a point of giving them institutional resources they needed for such endeavors. So in, in short, the, the principal's relationships with faculty and the students mirrored that of the school culture. Whether one influenced the other isn't so clear, but they reinforced each other uh, for sure. Um, the principal's relationship with faculty over the individually guided education was a different matter. Uh, the IGE program was imposed by the district and the faculty felt like they had no choice or discussion over it initially, even though they, they selected it in a way. Um, they felt a degree of, of resistance initially and Mrs. Michael resorted to formal hierarchical authority to implement the program. 
In the faculty meetings of the first two years, she reminded teachers they had to implement IGE or find a job in another school district. Um, at the end of the first year, she even demanded three teachers transfer, and these are tenured teachers, and uh, this kind of led to a lot of conflict. Uh, eventually, two of them were persuaded to leave, but the third filed a grievance, um, and it was, it was a point of, of contention. Faculty were upset some uh, since they didn't feel the, the, that the involuntary transfer was fair of the two teachers and many didn't know how to implement the IG in the first year, so there was a little bit of frustration in that kind of top-down authoritative implementation. By the third year, the teachers were more comfortable with IGE and they resisted less, and the principal resorted to more positive reinforcement and lessened her use of uh, official powers. So, uh, but I don't want you to get the, the wrong idea. Metz makes it clear that the resistant teachers were a minority at, at best, and uh, that there was a degree of respect even so. Um, so this, this anger or uh, resistance didn't diffuse, say, uh, to make a, a dysfunctional faculty culture. It remained kind of a positive functional one. So in summary, um, the distinctive feature of Adams Avenue School was the constructive relationships that it created. Um, it had a particular technology was the, the effort, and that technology was uh, the formal IGE program to a moderate degree, um, and the positive relationships seemed to reinforce the elements of the IGE. Um, for example, the aspects of IGE that rendered negative judgment were uh, private, uh, sorry, the aspects of IGE that rendered negative judgment private were reinforced. Um, uh, the focus on individual or relative performance was reinforced. And the effort to nurture individuals and relationships via supportive skills groups was reinforced. So the pride of slow learners was protected and special activities built a sense of fun and camaraderie. The technological or task arrangement of the school did not work alone. It required a faculty culture and school character that assumed respect would breed further respect. Um, the lack of training and rush to get IGE going led the principal to use her formal authority and to push IGE through, um, and the principal believed it was her choice to do this in response. It was not a pressure from the district office per se that she perceived. Um, but even so, this pressure from the principal led the faculty to be somewhat resistant and upset at first. A minority remains somewhat angry even later, but the faculty and principal did find ways to work respectfully and productively together. Again, this is par partially a result of the small schools and the positive collegial ethos. Um, the teachers believe the small schools contributed to their getting to know their students individually, and this was the secret to their success. They did not notice the contribution of their culture. Students didn't either. They didn't explicitly recognize that they had this particular culture that was distinctive. They saw it as natural. Um, and they didn't even really recognize the IGE program as contributing uh, that much, even though Metz's kind of characterization did see it to be so. Um, instead, they had a benign belief that seemed natural to them, and the cultural operated there at its best, according to Metz. So we have this story about a uh, technology uh, and of uh, small schools and a particular curriculum that changed the ethos or constructed a positive ethos or culture of a school that led to a kind of social structure uh, that was mutually reinforcing and generally positive uh, by Metz's account. So I, I try to develop uh, a summary table of, of looking at a case um, and how we can use the organizational elements to kind of decipher it and make sense of it. Um, the main storyline or the dominant pattern of inference, you'll see this kind of line used in um, Graham Allison's case of the Cuban Missile Crisis in another lecture. Uh, the main storyline here is that here you have a technology uh, that's imposed on a school, the IGE program, and the, the argument is, uh, or even a small school's kind of uh, program is also kind of uh, implicit there. And this kind of uh, changes the social structure in a good way, in spite of the population's disadvantages and, and potential for divisiveness. So that's the first thing that we get, if we think about just what the general story of this case is. Now here are organizing concepts. We, we, we start to think about the elements and try to pick them out here, we'll start to see things. Um, so for example, 
uh, for actors and participants, um, we have students as a racially heterogeneous population. More of them are minority, poor, and less prepared than the rest of the city. Uh, the principal, Mrs. Michaels, uh, is a key actor. The teachers as actors are important too, but they're young. They're not, a lot of them are less established. Um, there's a teacher union in place that's for or against this new curriculum, and if people resist that they're protected versus uh, the principal uh, out to remove them. Um, there's a central administration that allocates funds like textbooks, training, resources. And then there's aggressive parents and local parents. So these are our, our key actors, at least the ones that, that METS relates. The goals, in general, uh, the goal was relatively simple, at least in her account, which was to treat discipline and achievement problems uh, and overcrowding that through this magnet school program uh, that will solve certain problems that are occurring in the district and for like the, the annex and for the, the junior high that existed there. Um, the social structure is a little more elaborate. Here we have teacher-principal relationships, teacher-teacher uh, -teacher relationships, teacher-student relations, and student-student relations. So we have different kinds of relationships and role relations that we can talk about. Um, the teacher-principal relationship is mostly positive. It has feedback and support. Um, some teachers are pushed out in year one and some resist and complain about it, but overall it's, it's pretty functional. Uh, the teacher relationships are collegial and there's frequent ac interaction in the faculty lounge. Uh, they have an instructional improvement committee and there's kind of a norm, a deeper norm uh, and belief system going on about uh, mutual respect and a focus on the students and building them up. Um, there's friendly teacher-student interaction, uh, and the norm is that teachers share rapport and positive expectation, expectations. So there's a belief that every kid has good points. There's no bad child, they just have bad moments. And uh, nonetheless, some of these teachers struggle, and those were the exceptions we talked about. Uh, the fourth uh, aspect of social structure is the students' relationships with each other, um, that uh, a lot of them have positive relationships uh, somewhat desegregated, and uh, there's kind of a positive organizational culture, uh, meaning they don't disidentify with the school. In terms of technology and tasks, we see, I mean, this is kind of a, a key feature, right, of, of what they're trying to implement. And here we have a multi-unit processing or small schools that they're imposing on this system. Uh, they have individually guided education, and that consists of discrete objectives of learning, like, you know, you're supposed to learn this, 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 and this. Um, and then they have performance assessments of whether they've actually accomplished that. Um, and they instructionally group students by how far they've gone through those objectives. Um, and then they uh, allocate rewards or where they are in the curriculum by that progress and by their effort. So it's by uh, less about um, achievement and more about uh, the degree of growth that these children experience. And then finally, the principal kind of evaluates teacher progress is uh, the, f the fourth part of the IGE curriculum. It's somewhat underemphasized in my uh, recount of, of that case. The last element is the environment, and here we had vocal parents in year one, typical parents, school district demands, press releases, so there's actually in the case, if you have a chance to read it, talk somewhat about the press. Uh, there's courts that are trying to impose desegregation um, through magnet schools potentially, and then there's this kind of gifted uh, school, uh, a push for a competition among parents to have a gifted school in the area. So now that we've kind of mapped out the elements, let's go back to the main storyline and try to figure out how the technology affected uh, things, and particularly how it affected the social structure, because that was the main storyline. And particularly, it's not only a change in the social structure through the technology, but the deep social structure in terms of beliefs and values. Um, so here we have the, the effect of technology on structure, how it affects the relations, norms, and beliefs, and you have small groupings and kind of uniform experiences for students in these small schools and for faculty, and this kind of bred familiarity. So the same students see each other all day, and the teachers in each unit kind of coordinate. So that was a clear kind of effect. In addition, um, the IGE program 
focused on local, localized or relative results, not standardized. And the honor roll was based on effort. And this kind of had a, an effect on the social structure in, in improving teacher-student relationships. It removed uh, judgment, there was more trust, less pressure. Uh, the pride of individual students was protected, particularly for the underachieving students. This was important in integrating them into the school. Um, and it improved student-student relationships by equalizing prestige of academic achievement. So, uh, you know, there weren't winners and losers, or at least not publicly seen winners and losers, as there were in a traditional curriculum. And then uh, a third thing is uh, the effect of IGE on teachers' beliefs. And it seemed to generally work and improve teacher-student relationships. And by year two, the teachers had more training and resources. But it's kind of difficult to change the hearts and minds of individuals, uh, even if we impose new practices. To go deep into social structure with a change in the tasks and technology is not always feasible. Um, so um, some of the teachers were set in their ways, and they reframed the reform as nothing new. They used their past practices and implemented things half-heartedly. But quite a few of the teachers uh, did feel like uh, um, they had these practices in place that reinforced um, their sense of rapport of students, their belief that all students are good, uh, and the like. And these were some of the minor practices that seemed to be reinforced by an IGE curriculum uh, as opposed to practices that maybe are in, in, in contradistinction with those kinds of uh, individually guided education programs. Um, and then finally, uh, this whole thing of technology was kind of assisted. Its effect on the culture was partly assisted by the, the, the principal's extraction of uh, faculty that may have undermined that culture to begin with. Um, so in some ways, uh, the, the principal's uh, draconian removal of a few teachers, or at least two uh, early on, may have assisted in this kind of conversion process. And the ultimate result um, that Met says the participants are really unaware of, and she thinks in a positive way that they're unaware of it, uh, was that the faculty culture had a benign view of human nature and a belief that respect builds respect. They weren't aware of this as a distinctive culture. They saw it as natural. And part of Metz's argument is that when, when a social structure runs that deep or is it, it's imposed that deep in our beliefs, that it has a tendency to reproduce itself um, in very easier ways than if uh, it's explicit and, and a point of contention. So the fact that it's naturalized uh, makes it something uh, more feasible to reproduce. So that's the case, uh, the case that we see a variety of organizational elements in, that we see that the case is really about a particular set of elements in interrelationship, that they influence each other and have this kind of uh, causal relationship, at least according to the author. And we start to see that the author's focus or the, the analyst's focus resides in a particular uh, set of elements and a particular kind of uh, arrangement of them. And through this, we, we have a better understanding of, of where the analyst is coming from. And if we knew the case in first hand or through other information, perhaps we could judge whether it was uh, uh, the right one to adopt or not. So in sum, this case application of uh, Mary Metz and using the organizational elements reveals kind of a natural system perspective. The technology, small schools, and IGE, uh, influences the social structure um, or the norms. And these two things seem to be mutually reinforcing. Uh, and they form more of a personal context for the students and for the faculty that's more enjoyable than, say, what they had before in the annex or even before that in the junior high. Um, the plan wasn't explicitly this, though, uh, to form a nurturing climate of rapport uh, and building rapport uh, but it, it happened nonetheless. And moreover, the reform or culture is never fully embraced. It's something that's kind of an accomplishment, so you have to continually work at it. And through this analysis, we come to see that and kind of come to see what Adams Avenue School might have to do or reinforce or what the principal would need to know in order to keep managing it um, and to sustain this successful uh, educational innovation.